I'm Olga Viso, director here at the Center, and we're so pleased that you could join us uh, for the conversation today between acclaimed um, Irish playwright Enda Walsh and the Twin Cities' most beloved artistic director of the Guthrie Theater, Joe Dowling. And we actually have um, a surprise guest, an additional guest, which is why you see three seats um, around the the table there. Um, we have in town um, the drama critic for the Irish Times, Fenton O'Toole, uh, who has come here to see the production at the Guthrie. He's here today and is going to participate in the conversation to talk um, about the theater uh, in, in Ireland and beyond. So the presentation of the Walworth farce is actually the second time we've uh, presented the work of Enda Walsh um, here at the Walker Art Center. And in April, we screened uh, the new film, Hunger, which he co-wrote with um, Steve McQueen, uh, a visual artist. Uh, and it was an incredible film. We did a series of screenings. Uh, and it, it tells the story of the hunger strike of, of Bobby Sands. And it just in 2008, it won uh, the, the Commodore at the Cannes um, Film Festival. So it's, it's really wonderful to be able to bring Enda here for the first time in Minneapolis, although we presented um, his work here before. Um, Enda is really among Ireland's uh, most successful and really most widely um, performed contemporary playwrights. And his plays have contributed considerably uh, to the ongoing interest in new Irish theatrical writing um, around the world. And his plays have been performed worldwide and they've been translated into 20 different languages. So in addition to the Walworth farce, uh, his plays include Disco Pigs, Bed Bound, Small Things, Chat Room, and his most recent work, The New Electric Ballroom, opens um, in New York this week. And has received four Edinburgh Fringe First Awards, as well as Critics' Choice Award, and the Edinburgh Herald Archangel Award for his contribution to the Edinburgh uh, Festival Fringe. So in addition to his plays, he's actually written two radio plays and several screenplays. And he is currently under commission to write two more films, an adaptation of the children's story, Island of the Ants, by Eva Ibbotson, and a biography of the singer Dusty Springfield, which I'm sure Joe will, will talk to Enda about. And actually, Enda will be available after uh, the talk um, at 1.30 outside uh, to sign his most recent book, uh, which we, we have for sale here at the shop, which has the Walworth farce as well as the um, new electric ballroom. So Joe Dowling, of course, is so familiar to so many of us here in the Twin Cities, has been the Guthrie's uh, artistic director since 1995. And he's directed more than 35 Guthrie productions during his tenure, including Brian Friel's Faith Healer, in which he's currently making his American acting debut. Uh, it's really been a busy week for Joe, and uh, we're just thrilled that he took the time to be with us today and to engage in this conversation. Other directorial credits for Joe include um, for the Broadway stage, as well as prominent theaters across the US, England, and Ireland. And Joe has served as artistic director of the Abbey Theater, the Abbey's second stage, the Peacock Theater, the Irish Theater Company, and the Gaiety. And he also founded the Young Abbey, which is Ireland's first theater and education group, as well as the Gaiety School of Acting, which is Ireland's premier drama school. So incredible talents. Among all of that, he holds four honorary doctorates and is a member of the Artistic Directorate of the Globe Theatre in London. And under Joe's leadership, his vision for the new Guthrie Theatre became a reality when the current theater comp three theatre complex opened on the Mississippi River in 2006. Um, in addition, we have, as I mentioned, Fenton O'Toole, who's joined us today. And Fenton is a columnist, assistant editor, and drama critic for the Irish Times, and he's been there um, since uh, 1988. He was also drama critic for the New York Daily News from 1997 to 2001. And he's a literary critic, historical writer, and also a political commentator um, who's just been highly published. So we're thrilled to bring these three individuals together um, to talk about not only the Walworth farce, um, but Irish theater and beyond. So please join me in welcoming Enda Walsh, Joe Dowling, and Fintan O'Toole. Thank you very much, Olga. It's a uh, nice, great pleasure for me to be back on Vineland Place after <laughs> an absence of some years and to welcome two really 
great uh, guest, Zenda Walsh, of course, as Olga says, one of the really great uh, younger Irish playwrights, uh, and, and uh, terrific to have you here, Enda, uh, as well with uh, Wal well with Farce. And Fintan O'Toole, an old friend and um, a colleague from Dublin, uh, now deputy editor of the Irish Times, and um, in, in, in his role as drama critic, he and I sparred on many occasions, and hopefully, hopefully today we might get a few of those sparks going again. You never know, you never know. <laughs> Good that you're sitting between us, yes. Yeah. <laughs> But, but I, I mean, obviously, we're here today because of uh, Enda and the the Walworth farce, um, and uh, having seen the play in, in 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 New York, I mean, it's it's an extraordinary piece of work, uh, Fintan, and you've seen it as well. It's an extraordinary piece of work, um, and and so much that you write and that the new generation of Irish writers write, in in a way. Uh, how much does it draw on what has gone before? Because you certainly subvert many of the of the kind of shibboleths and, and ideas that were sort of hugely important in the kind of classical Irish drama. And how much is that, con you conscious of that, or how I'm, much is I'm that not, just? I'm not, I, I have done, but I'm not, con I'm not conscious of it. I mean, uh, I'm a great, uh, um, I love Irish theatre, you know, very, very influenced by a number of playwrights, you know, throughout sort of our history. Uh, so it's, a, it's, in your, it's in your DNA and it's in your sort of education and, you know, what the things that you love and all that type of thing. I didn't sort of personally sort of go out to... But, you know, you're always going to have echoes of other playwrights when you sort of sit down in front of a piece of paper or a laptop. Uh, you know, like, you know, you're, you're um, you know, it sounds so naff, but you feel, you feel like, you know, you are not alone. You know, that there are many, many sort of like writers around you. And, uh, and I do feel like that, and I do feel, you know, that there's, that there's, there's echoes in it. I write fast, so the play wrote in about sort of four weeks, and I got, so I, I, feel, I feel completely disconnected to the work as soon as I've, 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 uh, I've written it. It's gone, like, you know, but, uh, so I can look at it very sort of objectively, but I can see sort of echoes of many, many playwrights in there, and images, I suppose, from Irish theatre that we would sort of know. Uh, the man at the door, or the girl at the door, or whatever, is, is a wonderful image in sort of Irish theatre, again and again and again. I do, I do a lot of work in Germany, and they're always roaring laughing. They're always going, what is this man at the door thing, and <laughs> woman at the door? <laughs> and this family drama stuff, you know, they just think it's hilarious. I was going, well, that's just our thing. We, you know, we annihilate the family, you know. But, like, it, but in, the, in, the, old, in the old days, it would have been the man at the half door, so at least we've progressed to a full <laughs> door now, yeah. As soon as we can get the old sliding door, then we, you so know, we're, we'll really we're be in the 21st century. We'll be definitely in the 21st century. <laughs> <laughs> but you're, you're, you know, you say that there, these echoes are there, but you're not conscious of them. But I think, you know, that if you look at, at, at your work, at Martin McDonough's work, it, it, it is so, it, it, you, you couldn't but be Irish writers. Isn't that true? I mean, would you say, Fintan? I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> uh, I wrote an absolutely brilliant essay about um, <clears throat> 15 years ago, <laughs> uh, which... Uh, I've read it, I've read it. You, you must have read it, must have read it, yeah. Read it, yeah. Um, <laughs> which, which really explains um, in absolutely convincing detail why, um, <laughs> why, why Enda couldn't exist, you know, why, why this sort of era of Irish drama was over, you know. I, I mean, actually, it was about how, you know, we were used to, we were spoiled in, in Ireland because we were used to sort of, here's the next great playwright coming along every... A uh, couple of years, and I, was, I explained to my own um, complete satisfaction, you know, really why, why this really, you know, that was rooted in the nature of a certain kind of Irish culture, a certain kind of Irish society, and it was over. Um, and I'm really happy to say I was completely wrong. You know, it was, it was just absolutely wrong. Brilliant, but wrong. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and and it is actually, it, it is kind of remarkable the continuity, you know, that, uh, and it's not a continuity of, of uh, you know, everybody, uh, you know, the baton being passed on in some kind of straight line. But it's this sort of bouncing off the past that's, that's continually there. Um, and I think part of it is that uh, it, it's actually almost the, in a way, it's the absence of a single fixed tradition. You know, it's, it, 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 that may sound paradoxical, but if you have a single fixed tradition, then you almost have to either reject it or, or be part of it. You have to make that choice. And for historical reasons, Irish theatre or Irish playwriting, I suppose is really what we're talking about here, is, is um, much more angular than that. Partly because of its relationship with England, historically. You know, uh, the great Irish playwriting tradition, uh, by and large, happens in London. You know, going back to George Farker, through Sheridan, 
uh, through Shaw, through Oscar Wilde, and of course you're also directing at the moment in, here, here I know. Um, it, it, it had that relationship with England, and then you had a reinvention uh, around the, the, the turn of the 19th century. You had the very conscious attempts to found an Irish theatre rooted in Ireland, um, which of course you know, set up this sort of strange sense of who is Irish? Is, is, has the Shaw Irish anymore? Uh, what about Sheridan? What about Wilde? You know, uh, and this continues. Like, so Beckett is Beckett Irish? Um, of course, he's Irish. He writes in French. I mean, who else could he possibly be? You know, I mean, it's like <laughs> if they're successful, um, they're yeah. Irish. Uh, uh, <laughs> Not precisely. Uh, so you you have this kind of. But the interesting thing too, because you're, I think that's a really interesting point about the 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 relationship with London, and you live in London now, and, yeah. and the play Warworth Farce is set in London, and yet it's an a, a, a real. Irish play, and I'm reminded in it, very different play, but I'm reminded in it of Tom Murphy's uh, Whistle in the Dark, uh, yeah. the, the Irish family transplanted to England. and the, 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 Again, that continuity, though, what you've done with this because of the, the way you've used the whole farce thing, which is not an Irish tradition. Well, there's huge traditions in Irish of the immigrant play, isn't there? There's many, many, many plays, and you know, the, the, the guys, the builders abroad and all that type of thing, Whistle in the Dark. And, all of that, and I knew, you know, I knew sort of sitting down that I had to actually sort of write that play. You know, it is a sort of write a passage play to write, it, isn't it? You have to go about doing it. And, uh, but I really, really dislike a lot of those plays, the later sort of plays of guys sitting in pubs and just chatting to one another and going, oh Jesus, if only I was back home in the green and all that type of thing. And, and, and they can be quite mawkish, they're really great. Well, I mean, Tom is, Tom is like, you know, like a hero of mine, Tom Murphy, and, and has influenced all my generation. Uh, um, but um, but you know, I had to sort of I had to sort of embrace that and, and go. Well, what is it? You know, what is that sort of type of play, and, and what is that genre of play? So after sort of reading them and all and all that type of thing, I thought, well, I'll I'll, I'll try I'll try my I'll try my hand on it because there is something in it. You know, there's there's great lonesomeness there and and dis, you know dislocation and uh, all this type of thing, and uh, and of course there's lovely sort of there's there's very sort of silent you know lonesome drama in it a real sort of heart, a real sort of aching and yearning, you know, that I wanted to do. I don't have any of those sensibilities myself as a person. You know, like I tend to sort of, you know, like a pfft at them myself, but which is a reason enough to actually sort of to investigate them and to investigate those characters and try and sort of feel that for them and, and you know, let it on its way. But the whole sort of farce element thing, I suppose, was a complete sort of shock, you know, that it, it turned out the way it turned out. And this, but the whole other part of Wall with Farce, which is so intrinsically Irish and you take it to a whole new level is the whole question of storytelling. Mm. Because storytelling is so in, intrinsic to the Irish culture and, and yet you take it in the play to a level where it's, it, it's actually quite dangerous. Uh, because while it's a very funny play, it's also extremely dark in so many of those areas and Irish stories tend to, tend to be. Um, God, I had a sort of, I was, I was drinking in the Sackville Lounge um, about like a month ago, which is a pub in Dolan. So late at night and there was a guy beside me, you know, that sort of thing. And he was really, really, really in a really dark place. So I think it was drinking since about sort of 12. And we came in after, you know, opening up the new electric ballroom in the Peacock. And I knew that I was about to just hear a story, you know, that sort of way. It was about to arrive, you know, but from a really, 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 really harsh sort of place. But it was that sort of brooding thing in the corner that there's, you know, it was going to be big stuff. It was always going to be, you know, he was going to proclaim something. And Irish people, by Jesus, love sort of proclaiming, you know, like that, and history and family and where we are and, you know, politics and all that type of thing. And sure enough, you know, like, and I live in London, I was, you know, I forget about it. And you go back and you go, God, this is quite raw. This is really, this is big stuff. I mean, it was the drink talking, of course, you know, as well, you know, but like, uh, it was a very sort of, uh, it was a real, really real, yeah, um, big Irish moment for me. I was like reminded of this person in the room who's just about to go, right, do you know what? And he just annihilated me because now I don't have an Irish accent. I'm talking as a Londoner. So he just went into the whole thing of identity and why am I over there? You know, and how can you tell, you know, you know call yourself sort of a, you know, a, an Irish writer when you're over there and you're sort of, you, you have this English twang to your accent. So he completely, he was holding on to the, mm. you know, you know, the, the history of Ireland and then fucking attacking me. <laughs> 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 but you know, you were moment. talking to earlier of the, the no fixed tr uh, tradition and that somehow or other, but there's a danger, isn't there also, which s you, you, uh, Ender has avoided and I think, um, you know, Conor McPherson has avoided and others, of getting rooted in 
that history and in that tradition. It's, it's a really dangerous line you, 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 mm. you walk between honoring somehow the kind of the righteous of the past and what's happened and actually for creating something new. And, and, and you know, it's an interesting uh, thing to watch in, in your work and in the others. Well, it, it is absolutely fascinating because, you know, um, there, there's no doubt about the fact that there's a, it, 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 it's both a source of great strength, I'd imagine. You know, as, as you say, you're not alone. But also, you're not fecking alone. You know, you've got all these ghosts brooding around you, and and there is this sense of, of um, you know, how can you how can you recreate the territory? Uh, and I think it is absolutely remarkable, and I think I think it is an incredible achievement by by Enda and, and, and a handful of other people. I mean, over the last decade, really, uh, to completely contradict my own uh, sense, you know, that that actually we kind of reached a certain point where where this sort of literary tradition of Irish theatre was no longer adequate and was no longer capable of sustaining itself. Um, and in fact, it has sustained itself, and it sustained itself in really interesting ways, actually. Um, and w one of the ways, I think, and maybe this is part of the way that the escape has been possible, is that because you've had this very fractured sense of a tradition, you've had these huge figures, you know, you've all these kind of great male deities up there, but a lot of their work, very, uh, very strangely, has been unproducible in Ireland. So, for example, William Butler Yeats, you know, perhaps the greatest poet of the 20th century, the, the key founding figure in, in, in the Abbey, of, of, of which you, know, you were artistic director for so long. Most of Yeats's plays are completely unproduced, and some could argue unproduced. Unstageable. Yeah. Uh, Unstageable, yeah. But, but they're, they've also, I think, have had a huge influence on, on younger writers. Not necessarily that they only look and they read Yeats and they say, okay, I can, I can write poetry like Yeats, because <laughs> you don't. But there's really two ways of doing theatre to be absolutely crude and generalistic about it. Um, one is uh, to enact, you know, to, to play out in front of you a story. And the other is to evoke. And I mean, it's very interesting that you know, you're, you're doing Faith Healer, which is, I suppose, a classic piece of evocation. Mm. Um, and the, the, the evocative tradition is Yeats. Mm. You know, the, there's the opening line of one of Yeats' plays is, I call to the eye of the mind. You know, and that's summoning up that poetic tradition. Uh, is also there, but kind of buried because the mainstream tradition has been a sort of naturalistic one. And I think, whether consciously or subconsciously, there's, there's a great kind of resource for Irish writers in being able to sort of rediscover or bring together these different strands of Irish theatre. Um, and in doing that, it's because you don't just have this one stream, you can, you can draw on tradition and at the same time be subversive of a lot of what's gone before. And I think also, you know, just the very simple thing, which is humour. I mean, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, your work is, is it, it's incredibly funny. And, and the, the antic spirit of humor means that you, you just can't allow yourself to get caught up in reverence for a tradition. So usually when a tradition is being used, say in Mac Martin McDonough's work or, or, or in Enda's or whatever, you know, it, 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 it's being used with that great anarchic comic spirit where it's being parodied and at the same time being shaped and reshaped, and I, I think that's a lot of the energy comes from yeah. that. We've all, we all, when we're, whenever we're in the rehearsal room, it is the sort of best one. You always get a sort of sense that we're deep, because I look at, like the, and I think that it's an incredibly traditional play. It's a yeah. very, very traditional play. But, you, <clears throat> but the, 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 an abstraction sort of happens, and you can actually sort of watch that sort of abstraction, but it is effectively looking at a sort of a realistic sort of sketch of something, and then begin to see it just sort of break and fold, you know, you know, disjoint and all that type yeah. of thing and fracture and all that type of thing and re-referencing -reference, re itself and folding in on itself until it's sort of like, you know, <laughs> it's yeah. nothing, you know, like it sort of it doesn't exist. You came into theatre, um, it wasn't in your, in your family background, was it? No, no, no. Well, no, my, my ma acted years and years ago, but before I came around, there's six in the family, so before I came around, she had sort of like, she said, I'm getting out of theatre, there's too many drinkers. <laughs> so, she, <laughs> so she got out of the theatre. But, uh, uh, but no, 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 I don't. So I, how did it sort of, because, you, you know, I mean, how did, how did it happen? What, what was the impetus that? I don't, well, I, was, I, was, I went to a community school and, and uh, 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 Kilbarrick in uh, North Dublin, and two of my teachers were, were great writers, but they were starting their career. And when I think about it, they were only about 24, 25 when they were teaching me. You know, they were kids. So One what, of them was Roddy Doyle. Roddy the, Doyle and the novelist yeah. and Paul Mercier who's like had a massive influence, who's an, who's an amazing, I think a great, great, great playwright. 
and brilliant theatre uh, practitioner as well. Oh, geez, brilliant he's, man. He's so so great, and it, so they had a huge influence on me, uh, particularly sort of Paul. But they were good guys. They were always really good guys. <laughs> and really sort of naively, I sort of finished college and studied, you know, communications in our minds, wanting to be a, a filmmaker, you know, and at a time when there was no film in, in Ireland. You know, I, I sort of likened to it. It was like sort of, you know, training, to, training in dentistry in a country where people don't have any teeth. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just like... <laughs> <laughs> but it was a really, really stupid thing to be doing. But anyway, but I, was, I, I knew I actually, I wanted to make stuff. You know, I wanted to be in a band, and I was in a band, and, uh, uh, you know, like, and sang and all that. But I just wanted to sort of say something, and I suppose theatre was the cheapest thing to do. And I ended up down in sort of Cork, like, working on the Triscoll stage with a, a company where we gave ourselves two years, lived on, you know, Guinness and Crisps, and, and you know, and lived in abject poverty on, you know, schemes and on the dole. And, uh, but I was quite brave and, you know, like an, uh, or brilliantly sort of naive and um, but a little bit honest. I, we used to sort of do this devised work and I was the, the, the writer, you know, like of the, the group of 15 and the designated writer because I liked spending more time by myself than any of the rest of us, you know, so uh, we used to Coming produce... from a family of six, I can understand <laughs> yes, why. <laughs> we used to produce this terrible work, absolutely appalling work. And, uh, uh, but I, was, I, I used to come out to the audience after, we'd, we'd, and I'd go, that was terrible. I know it was terrible. Why was it terrible? <laughs> and, you know, like, and, and over two years, we actually, they, they actually were our dramaturg, you know, they, they shaped us and, you know, like... And I just want to warn the audience, that will not be something we'll be taking up at the Guthrie. <laughs> I can assure you. <laughs> you could fly me over, I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> right, ladies and gentlemen. By the way, you're really, really, really doing theatre critics out of work there, right? I have to object. Yeah. Yeah. If, you don't, if, you, if you want the audience to tell you why it was terrible, why have theatre critics? <laughs> well, nowadays we have blogs. That's right. They yeah. tell us this no is -blog. This is pre blog. But, you, but it you know, it, it's, it's, I'm interested, uh, and this is a very exclusively Irish conversation when I say, here we are, three Dubliners, and mm. um, you went to Cork. Yeah. I did go to Cork. You know, this Which is, is like a, going to China. I well, mean, we're, you, yeah. <laughs> there, there's a kind of a betrayal there uh, that's really kind of serious. Well, I didn't know, and I didn't realize what Cork was until I arrived down there. I'd never been there before, and I went, why, the, why is, what, excuse my language, but why, why, why the fuck are people talking like this? They had the maddest accent. I was going, I have no idea what they're saying, and it's only two and a half hours on the train or whatever it is. So it was like, but it was wonderful for me because I had aspirations of being a writer, but I was no writer. And, you know, like, and, you know, aspirations of making theatre, but I was no theatre maker. But it was sort of like trying to learn a dialect, you know, and I wrote this very naive p play called The Ginger Ale Boy about a ventriloquist who has a, a nervous breakdown, you know, <laughs> and, you know, and it was sort of like, a, and, and uh, I played the part and all that type of thing. And, uh, but like, it actually had something. It was a terrible, terrible piece in many ways, but, you know, but it had something in it. And then I wrote Disco Pigs on, on, uh, uh, directly afterwards, but which was my sort of which was my dialogue with with Cork about why are you talking like that? <laughs> uh, you know why do you so always see yourself as the smaller sort of person? And you know and it's you know a piece about sort of identity and about sort of you know striving for something sort of bigger than you are. And 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 Cork as the second city in Ireland is just dramatically it's very interesting for a play, right? It's just the city itself, the shape of it is very interesting. You know, the fact that it sort of sits in a, in, in a basin, effectively, and there's, a, like, there's, a, you know, there's, there's lots of houses around it, and it's just sort of down here, and it feels quite sort of, you know, damp, and, and the people are aggressive. Yeah. You know, but and a great literary tradition, too, with yeah. Sean O'Fuelan and Frank O'Connor. Yes. I mean, it, it certainly, the, the, the rivalry between Dublin and Cork is more manufactured than real, yeah. but it's there. Great attitude, great sort of, you know, I suppose it's sort of the, the equivalent of, you know, it's probably Ireland's Texas, isn't it? It's that type of carry on. <laughs> Somebody I, will have to help me with that reference. I, I, do, <laughs> I, I just plucked that out of nowhere. It doesn't mean anything. I'm just going to throw it. It's the oil, the oil wells. It's the oil wells in Cork. It's the oil wells in Cork, yeah. <laughs> But, it, it, you know, it, there's, a, there's another point that we were talking about backstage, too, the, the lack of opportunity that you found as a young person wanting to get into theatre. Mm. Um, you know, I'm a generation before you, and, and when I started in the Irish theatre, you either got into the Abbey Theatre as an actor or you didn't work. Mm. That was it. There were no other alternatives. And or, or you got into the radio, there was a repertory company in the radio, uh, and, and those two entities with it were, were literally all that there was before subsidy uh, really took hold with the gate, 
Egypt and then eventually yeah. with and, 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 and it's a whole different scene now and I'm, I'm, yeah. that's why I was surprised in a way that someone of your generation didn't have more opportunities in Dublin but I mean you've watched Vinton the evolution of of theatre over the last 25 years and, and it has shifted dramatically hasn't it I mean Irish theatre oh yeah I mean um you're right. I suppose it's it's become a lot less institutionalized, um, and you know I know you're obviously part of that process yourself. I mean, in terms of the the, the very painful process of changing the abbey, um, you know that there was a link, I suppose, between the way in which you had these sort of state-sponsored institutions. You know, you had the you either had the state um, radio company, which had a, a repertory, um, or or you had the abbey, which you know was was the national theatre. Uh, which had a full-time repertory company, which was never big enough. It was one of those, it was like a kind of Soviet Union model, but without the money. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you had what? You had but four, with the Politburo. Uh, with the Politburo. And with all, so you, you had a lot of the drawbacks of having this kind of permanent company. But you only had to go out about 40 actors or something. You? With 40 yeah. actors on yeah. Saturday, yes. Which, you know, for running two theatres uh, permanently is, is, isn't easy. But some of it was, was wonderful. But, you know, I suppose it... it, it it's very hard for Americans to understand. You know, I, I remember when I, when I came here first, uh, when I was in New York, and somebody asked me about Galway, and I said, well, Galway's on, on the other side of, of Ireland. And he said to me, and so how long does it take you to get there? And, and, and I said, well, it takes about uh, two and a half, three hours. And so he said, hey, you call that a country? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, it, it's so strange. Uh, to you, I'm sure, like, Enda's talking about, you know, somewhere it's two and a half hours away on the train, and he doesn't know how they speak. You know, this is like... <laughs> It's a small place, and uh, one of the extraordinary drawbacks of Irish theatre, really, you know, when, when, when I would have started writing about it and going to theatre first, was it really was effectively a Dublin-based institution. Yeah. And effectively, in, in professional terms, it was two places. It was the Abbey and the Gate, uh, which were, the Gate was, was uh, run by the two great, the, I mean, extraordinary, by, by a gay couple, uh, the, the great actor Michael McLeamore and, and, and the director Hilton Edwards, um, and the Abbey was kind of the the national theatre with you know the traditions of O'Casey and Yates and Lady Gregory and all that sing. Uh, so they were kind of conventionally known as Sodom and Bigara. <laughs> yeah. And it was you know it was really that was what you had you know was 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 uh, <laughs> was, was was that uh, that very enclosed little world, um, which which of course did also produce extraordinary work because, because, almost because of the enclosure. Um, because of the sense, you know, that that uh, that this was local, um, and what you were seeing on stage kind of resonated very immediately with with the audience, or could do if it was powerful enough. But I think you know the great kind of shift was 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 uh, the realization that there was more to Ireland than Dublin, um, and uh, you know Cork, uh, Galway, in the West becoming particularly important, and you know Enda's been working with with the Druid Theatre Company there, which was. A really important development. You know, I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine this. You know, you, you're talking about a place which has this great theatrical tradition. I mean, G Galway, which is a significant city in Ireland, had never in its history, never in its history, had a professional theatre company. You know, <laughs> until the 1970s. You know, so, so you, you know, so you, you get both the poverty that comes out of that, which itself can be extraordinary, because with the poverty, what do you do? You say, well, what have we got? You know, we, we've got this weird fellow down from Dublin who, who doesn't know how we speak, you know, but, but has these ideas, who's interested in that the language becomes important. If you don't have the big institutions, what have you got? You've got language. So you, you, you deal with what you have. Um, so you, you, you deal with that. But then you also have this, you know, as that begins to change, you have this sense of, of excitement, of, of novelty, you know, of just beginning to open up. You have Freel setting up um, the Field Day Company in, in, in Derry, you have this relationship between writers and theatres beginning to, to emerge. And it's an, it's an incredibly interesting uh, period, I think. And in, in, in many ways, oddly, you know, it, it, that energy, I think, has carried through, isn't it? I mean, that, mm. that in a way, like, you're still working off those kind of that reinvention that was happening uh, from the late 70s into the, into the 1980s. Um, and oddly, again, you, as I said, you get this, this sort of this, this weird continuity, but it's a continuity of dislocation. Things have never settled down sufficiently to have this kind of big, overarching mainstream. Um, everybody still has to sort of reinvent it every time they, they come to try and do it. And there's still, you know, what's fascinating to me is that, you know, you get 
what Ender's has just been talking about, you know, what, what's he listening to? He's listening to the way people speak. Language remains at the absolute core of Irish theatre. And th this is, you know, why I thought this wouldn't last is because, you know, theatre's becoming much more physical, much more visual, and all of those elements have come into Irish theatre. It is now, I mean, it, it was, it was not accidental. I mean, Yeats said uh, at one point he wished he could put his actors in barrels to stop them from gesticulating and they would speak his lines beautifully. And then Beckett came along and actually put them in barrels. You know. <laughs> uh, and, you know, there is a very anti-physical um, tradition in Irish theatre, and that's been reversed. I mean, and you see, you'll see it in the Wild Word Farce. It's a very physical piece of work as well. Um, but, but one of the amazing things is you, you've got the physicality, and yet you still have the obsession with language as a self-conscious thing. It's, you know, it's even you've, you know, in the Wild Word Farce, you hear like the people, as they're speaking, they're conscious of the way they're speaking themselves, aren't they? I mean, it's... They are. It's, is, that, well, is that sort of tradition from sort of Shannon Key, sort of people standing up in hedges and, and you know, like in telling a story, the storyteller in the, in the village and things like that. You know, that it's... It's also fascinating to me because you talk about Derry and Field Day and the north-south divide being, I mean, the, the major dominant thing of 20th century Ireland is the division of Ireland in the 1920s and what resulted from that. And, and, and much of the dynamic, indeed, of, of, you know, if you look at O'Casey and you look at, at through to Friel, there is a dynamic that, that goes about the politics. But your work sort of just assumes the politics of Ireland, in a way without actually referring to it. It's a different, again, a different generational thing, I think, that, that uh, it's, it's, we're not as conscious now of those divisions that, that really did motivate a great deal of Irish literature um, through the years. Mm. You know, the North doesn't really feature in your work, does it? It doesn't, but, you know, I mean, playwrights don't sort of live sort of like outside of a community. Like we sure. live in the community. Yeah. We live sort of like everything is historically and sort of social. It's all sort of implicit in you, I suppose. You mm. know, it's all, in, it's all in you, and it's going to sort of come out in some sort of way, and there's sort of their strains in, you know, in the work and the characters and their anger and whatever, or their sort of love or their loss or whatever. You know, that, you know that it's, it's written in a particular sort of period of time. I wrote a play called Bedbound, and I sort of, I was looking back and I was going, oh my God, right, it's sort of like, uh, right, uh, you know, in fairness, it was about the sort of, you know, I, I can sort of see it now, it felt like, you know, it was, it was meant to be a play about me and my dad, and it was effectively about me and my dad's sort of relationship. But the energy and the sort of, and what it was, was more about actually the beginning of the Celtic Tiger. It was the sort of the, you know, it was, it was this man who just, who builds himself up, just wants more money and creates a universe and has himself at the center of a universe and, you know, like, and just annihilates everything and must sort of keep on sort of proclaiming how wonderful and how brilliant his world is and what he's created and all of this sort of thing and you know but he feels a very small man and he's shouting this sort of out all this type of thing and it all crumbles of course all this type of thing but you know I mean yeah I mean playwrights live in a live in a society and live and you know I, I can't I you know I can't write sort of you know polemic I can't write sort of anything like that mm. although I know it will sort of come out in some sort of way but it is interesting because, I mean, that, that period you're talking about from the late 70s, early 80s, which was the, probably the worst period in terms of the violence in Northern Ireland and, the, and the, uh, the issues about how this was ever going to be resolved and the hunger strike, which I know you've dealt with in the movie and so on. And, and, and writers sort of almost routinely felt it necessary to write their Northern play. And we got a lot of really bad writing, too close to the time, too... Um, and somehow or other your generation, and when you came along, it was kind of liberating that, in fact, these were no longer going to be the, the, the kind of, uh, you know, the, the issues. They're there. As you say, they're, they're intrinsic, but they're... they're, they're but, but, it's but, but much also more at times, free. I mean, I look at sort of English theatre, and they have this great, I mean, this thing of, like, doing verbatim theatre, of doing, like, political theatre, or David Hare, you know, this very, you know... And we don't, we don't, we don't... We don't we have we don't have that. We don't we don't have that. It's too sort of it's too it feels too too soon or too to, mm. to, to talk about it. Mm. You know, to talk about it in that way and that's sort of overtly sort of political or you know, like you know, it feels too it's too soon, right? Yeah, I think I think there's a big element to that. I mean, um, uh, but again it's it's partly to do with the lack of a realistic tradition, you know. Yeah. Um, that uh, and again, you know this because you've directed O'Casey so so wonderfully, you know. Our our social realism keeps getting pulled into the man at the door, 
mm. the, the language, the farce, all of those kind of things operate within it. And I've often thought about this because it's, it's, it, it, it goes against the grain of what people tend to think about Irish theatre, think about it's all about Ireland, you know. And of course, in a way, it is, you know, we're, when we've all been talking about Ireland. But um, the, 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 the point about Irish theatre is the theatre bit, you know, that, that actually what's implicit in it is uh, this kind of playful, ludic spirit, which is why we're talking about it. It's why it sort of has an international reputation. Um, is that it, it keeps spinning off away from the subject. You know? mm. So just to give you a simple example, right? Um, Brian Friel, whom, whom Joe's performing here uh, wonderfully at the moment, um, like Friel lived on the border between Northern Ireland and, and uh, still does, between Northern Ireland and the Republic, grew up in Northern Ireland, is absolutely deeply shaped by the conflict, by all everything around the conflict. He's in some ways a very political man. He's a very traditional Irish nationalist in a lot of ways made one attempt to write a contemporary play about the conflict, um, which was a kind of response to a particular uh, uh, infamous incident in the conflict called Bloody Sunday, when the British Army opened fire on demonstrators on the streets of Derry and, and killed 14 people. Um, Friedel wrote a play called Freedom of the City. Um, and you think, OK, this is the Derry playwright. This is you know, the great spokesman for nationalist Ireland is now writing the play about this atrocity. And what's the play about? The play's about, well, I can't really write a play about it because who knows what happened anyway. You know? So his, his, his instinct is to write a political play, a, almost a polemical play for, for once in his life. But the, theatrical, the theatricality takes over. It's about, it's mm -hmm. about language. It's about you know, how, how can we represent in language the truth behind the ways in which this is perceived. So I suppose my point is simply that uh, you could say that one of the great weaknesses of Irish theatre actually is that thing. You know, we, don't, we don't have that English tradition of, no. of being able to intervene directly in political affairs. And it is a weakness. And I think it's been a particular weakness over the years of the Celtic Tiger. So we've just been through this, this boom time you know, when we were um, the, the great poster child for free market globalisation around the world. Uh, it's this huge kind of transformation of Ireland into this, this very, very wealthy globalised society. We're now reverting, thankfully, back to the 19th century. <laughs> but uh, it's going to be interesting. You theatrically. Like you. Uh, yeah, uh, but but there there are no Celtic Tiger plays, or no successful Celtic Tiger plays. Mm. We actually couldn't write about it because of this thing about the closeness, but also because uh, when anybody sets out to start writing it, the, mm. uh, the the impulse is so metaphorical. It is yeah. that somebody immediately starts thinking maybe this could be a version of Antigone, or you know, maybe this is like, I'm gonna use the Irish sagas to try and do, you know, it just, I know, you just actually write a play about you know, somebody working in a, an IT factory. No, I can't really do that. And even Passion Machine, even Passion yeah, Machine yeah. And, and Studs, when you think of that, I mean, written in, at the time of the Great Recession, like in the 1980s, and the wonderful, but it's metaphor, right? I mean, it is, and it's barely, sort of, it's yeah. barely there. I think the, the best political play written in Ireland in the last 50 years is Brian Friel's Translations, mm -hmm. which is a play that absolutely explains in very clear and very beautiful terms the origins of the conflict in a way that if he had written it in a more contemporary vein, yeah. would have, people would have found either polemic or mm -hmm. would have been arguing. The, but he, he takes it back to 1832 and says the two things that changed Ireland in the middle of the 19th century. One was the um, uh, ordnance survey maps been changing the names of the places and therefore changing, destroying tradition that had begun before. And the second was the introduction of um, uh, primary education for all children and, and all taught through English. And, and suddenly he, he to a, uh, I, I, I think you were probably there too, the first night in Derry, uh, this play is in, uh, in many ways a deeply subversive play, um, played in the Guild Hall in Derry, which was the seat of Unionist power in Northern Ireland and, and of course, gerrymandered power. And to, to watch the walls of that place crumble under this play was an extraordinary event in Irish history, let alone in Irish theatre. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and yet it's a, a play that speaks, goes way beyond Ireland. I mean, it's done in every, every culture in the world. And so again, you're back to that thing that it's, it, it's taking some distance and it's also creating a kind of a really metaphorical look at who we are and mm -hmm. what has created us rather than freedom of the city where he tried to write the burning he said he wrote it in a kind of a burning anger as a result of the event that took place and also of the report the widgery report yes. that actually yeah. uh, whitewashed the whole the whole event yeah. I mean, 
politics always comes up eventually, doesn't it? When oh, uh, get it, it does, and of course, what's fascinating about, about and translations, I mean, one of the reasons translations is so powerful is that it's sort of it's about the politics of language, you know. So, mm. so what you come back to again and again in in, in Irish playwriting um, is is that language itself is political. You know, that the, the, the forms in which we express ourselves contain, either consciously or more often subconsciously, contain a whole rake of things about identity, about place, about dislocation. Um, I mean, even the, even the way you talked about your accent, for example, you know, like, or the way people talk to you about your accent. Well, can, can you really be an Irish playwright if you've got a little bit of English in your, in your accent? You know, there's all this kind of, in one way, ridiculous, you know, absolutely ridiculous. But, but what makes it powerful theatrically is that uh, language then becomes a medium in which a whole range of other things get wrapped up. Um, and then I think you get out of that then, you get the impossibility of a, re of a, a realistic theater. Because you can't get a slice of life when people are both speaking and thinking about the way they're speaking at the same time. And so what, what you get is a kind of inbuilt playfulness and inbuilt self-consciousness, a tendency towards parody, um, towards pastiche sometimes, but it's always playing on these echoes of, of, of you know, what's being said in the past, what's being said now. Um, and I suppose that's, it's not just Irish theatre, of course, that's, that's very much instinct as well in, in, in the approach of a lot of Irish prose writers, for example, to the way Irish prose works. But I think it does make a particular kind of theatre, which is... is um, is at the same time incapable, perhaps, maybe that's over a strong statement, but I think you know, it's incapable of, of uh, mirroring directly Irish society mm. at any particular mm. time, and yet becomes one of the ways in which that society defines itself and understands itself. Mm. Um, and you know, there's a simple metaphor here, which is, <laughs> we'll go back to metaphors, but you know, in, um, in the 19th century, Stendhal, the great French writer, has a, has a line in, um, uh, Scarlet and Black is a novel about, a novel, he says, a novel is a mirror walking along a high road. And at the same time, in Ireland, you've got Mariah Edgeworth. It be, you know, is, is, he, she's using the image of nobody can hold a mirror up to Ireland because if you do, people wouldn't like what they saw and they'd break the mirror. And this image of the, the cracked mirror, Oscar Wilde uses it. James Joyce, of course, famously uses it at, in the beginning of Ulysses where Book Mulligan is shaving in the, in the mirror and it's cracked and he says it is the image of Irish art, the cracked mirror of a servant. And the cracked mirror is really what you get all the time in, in, in Irish theatre. It is reflecting, but at the same time as it's reflecting, it's also fragmenting and making new shapes. And it's that ability to make new shapes that makes theatre interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Tell us about the new electric ballroom because it's your next, it's coming to New York next week? Thursday, yeah. Thursday, wow. Yeah, next Thursday, yeah. And you, you started this, that? This Thursday. <laughs> what are we today? Yeah. <laughs> you started that in Galway as well with uh, yeah, the Druid with Company? Druid, yeah. With Rosalind Linehan, one of our favourites here. She's played a number of times as the Guthrie yeah, yeah. playing in it. Just tell us a little about it. Well, it's sort of like, again, I mean, like it's sort of, I mean, the, where, where the war with Forrest was, was effectively sort of about the relationship between me and my brothers. <clears throat> Strangely, uh, um, the uh, <laughs> the new electric ballroom is is the starting point in it. Is it uh, is is from um, well a couple of things, but uh, but but it's it's my primarily my mom's coffee mornings, and uh, I was interested in, uh, as a boy. I, I used to love I loved the company of older older women, <laughs> like much much older women, and I liked you know like I just liked you know like you know, watching them sort of discuss things and putting the world, you know, you know, to write and all that type of thing. And so as a starting point, it was that, but I knew I wanted to write a version, I wanted to write a sort of a, I, I, I finished the war with Forrest and then directly wrote the, uh, um, put, put it away and then directly wrote the new electric ball in the, uh, the, the next week. And I wanted to write because I, I liked this this notion of just creating theatre in living rooms. So it's about these um, these two el elderly women in the sort of sixties who um, are they've got a much much younger uh, sister who's about sort of forty or so, and uh, she comes home from the sort of the, 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 the it's, it's set in a rural village. You think not that I know anything about rural villages, but she sort of comes home and she dresses them up as their eighteen year old selves. And uh, uh, sort of with sort of with costumes and sort of wigs and you know makeup and and she gets them to play the night that their their heart was broken um, by the same man, 
And uh, so the play is about, well, why the hell is this 40-year-old woman actually doing that? And what is she trying to sort of get at? And, uh, and into it comes a man, a fishmonger, who just keeps on bringing fish more and more, more and more fish. And then it's sort of like, you know, like, a, and, it's, and it's, 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 it's uh, effectively, it's a story about a 40-year-old woman. You don't know whether she's torturing them or whether she's the nurse. And, uh, but it, she, she is the sister, and she's trying, to, she's trying to learn about love. She's yet to feel anything, feel anything and uh, she knows that actually she needs to sort of break out of that little routine and begin to begin to risk sort of falling in love so it is back to sort of for me you know I am amazed that we actually live the way we live as human <laughs> beings that we do get up in the morning and we go right another day I can't believe it you know it's I can't believe we do what we do and we go to sleep and we get up and we and we get going again and we do it and we keep on doing it and it is that, it is the sort of, it's, 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 it's you know, pushing up in a sort of a door today for me, the, the Hilton, the Hilton uh, Hotel in Chicago Airport. I'm going, oh God, and just put, put it out of that door, I got, I have no idea what the hell's going to happen today. <laughs> and being really, really terrified of that and, uh, um, and loving it and sort of like, in, uh, uh, I've always been a very, very anxious sort of little boy and, and now big man and, <laughs> and uh, you know and I but it's it's, it's probably a good thing for, as a playwright to have that you know it does amaze me and it does sort of surprise me that you know that we we live the way we actually sort of do as people you know so it is about that it's about risk fascinating we're going to open it up to the audience now and um, we have I understand microphones and they're going to come to you with it so if you have questions we would love to hear them and um, wait till the microphone gets to you because we want to make certain that we all hear the question and that it's uh, properly picked up by the sound system. There's a gentleman over there. Hi, I'm, I'm, I have a silly question to ask you about Warburg uh, Farts. Um, you said it very, very quickly, and yeah. it takes the majority of the audience a little while to cotton on to what's taking place. Yeah. Does that mean we must both, we must all see it twice before we really get it, because we wrote it spontaneously, or is it okay not to understand it for the first half of the first act? It's, it's, I think it's okay. I mean, my, I think it's okay not to sort of understand it, but it is understandable. It does all completely make sense. And uh, it all sort of like, it all, you know, in terms of the farce, because people get caught up and they go, oh my God, do I have to understand this bloody play? You know, this sort of this, the elements of this farce. But it actually, it, it, it does all sort of hang together. But I always really feel for the, I really feel for the audience at half time, because I go, oh my God, you know, would I go? I would, my, I would probably go, but thanks be to Jesus, a lot of people come back because you are only seeing actually 20% of the show. You feel that way. It begins to answer itself. And that was, I've never written an interval before. And they're the most difficult things to write, right? You know, like it's sort of like the notion of people going out and having a drink and coming back into the theater. But, you know, farce actually demanded, demanded that it be written the way it's written. You know, so really, you know, like I've, there's no, there's no history of farce in Irish theatre, I don't think, or whatever. So you know, but but you know, I I I had to learn it, you know, like and just the the, the notion of these men living in London and the sort of in a, in a flat and and farce existing in the West End and it's sort of farce seeps down into the mud and goes underneath the Thames and comes out and sort mm -hmm. of you know and grows up and then exists in some sort of form. That was so became sort of interesting to me. I completely agree. I'm sorry. You know, like. <laughs> I'm sure. I, I'm glad. I, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad I wasn't in your head. That's all I can say. <laughs> Herb Weiser. Um, could you describe the difference in your process, creative process, between writing a play and writing a movie? Yeah. Um, big difference. I mean. I, I mean. I. 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 I when it comes to sort of writing plays, I, I don't like getting in the way of it. I don't feel. Like, I don't feel it's. It's. It's authored by me. Uh, I really, I think the logic of the play sort of has to sort of has to exist on sort of stage. So I do sort of write completely from the from the character's point of view. I have no notion of where the play is going to go. Uh, it was a surprise to me that there was a knock on the door and guys arrived in with a coffin, you know, a, a, you know, a paper coffin. I was going, oh Jesus, it's a farce. I mean, that was a complete surprise to me. I don't set out to. I've only ever once set out to write a play, and it was terrible, you know, to write to 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 story to 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 find the story for it. And it was a terrible, terrible play. And, uh, and I'll never, ever do that again. I think it's just the characters need to write it, and they need to shape it, and it needs to feel very organic. With screenplays, by Jesus, I mean, it's just all about craft. You know, like, it's all about, you know, just your, 
you were writing this unwieldy sort of, you know, in this big form, and I, I find it very, very, very difficult. And, and, and there's lots of hands on your producers, you know, whacking you and all that type of thing. It's quite sort of tough. But I like the discipline of it, but I'm just much, much more aware of craft. While in theatre, I'm a fan of theatre, I love it. And uh, uh, I just write from the gut. You know, I don't like to sort of get in the way of it, you know. Roger. Uh, I was very struck with the uh, tight choreography all through this play. Yeah. And I'm not familiar with your other works, so I don't know whether that is a characteristic of all your plays, but uh, it was very striking. It had, has this been something you've always done, or was this a new... No, it was new. Or what, uh, it was completely new. Previously, like, sort of, like, like Victor would say, previously it was just people getting up there and... And the bed band was set in a bed. It was a father and a, and a, and a daughter in a, in, a, in a bed talking at one another. So there was no stagecraft to it. But the farce demanded, you know, like the farce demanded the shape that it was. And it was a real sort of surprise to me. But, uh, um, you know, I worked with, I can see Mike, I haven't seen him, how you, Michael? The director's up there of the, of the Walworth Farce. And, uh, um, and he came over to London when, I, when I'd written it and we read it together. And we could sort of see it in our heads. And we had sort of great sort of fun doing it. And now he's, he's worked you know, really physically before he's a, a Lecoq trained sort of actor and, you know, ha was going to br always bring that to it. But dramaturgically really, really helped me and pulled the play closer together and found the ending that, you know, the, the, the ending was sort of, I was avoiding the ending because I really didn't want to, I really didn't want to end it that way because it was just so heartbreaking for me to, to sort of, to imagine that poor, poor guy. But anyway, but, but anyway. People are going to... People Don't are, give the oh, end away. Some okay. people haven't seen it. It's, really, it's really happy. <laughs> and uh, he goes to Broadway and makes a fortune. <laughs> uh, you mentioned uh, working with the Germans and that they could not understand this image of the girl in the door. Mm -hmm. Would you speak a bit more about living in England, how long you've been there, and working with people of other countries... German, American, English, and Irish, and how different cultures or countries may perceive or understand theater. What are the differences, but what are basic human similarities that you have found in your experiences? Okay. Wow. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll sort of just take off my shoes. Uh, um, all right, I've got an enormous question. But, um, uh, I, direct, I, 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 directed, I directed Bed Band in Italian before I, I, I directed it in, um, in English. Uh, I don't have any Italian, uh, but it really sort of, it, uh, I can't stand words, you know, just word, talking words. And, you know, as much as I'm sort of like married to them and I have to create these images and I have to use these bloody words, I would love to sort of write something that doesn't have any of that, but I have to. And I can't do dance, so I have to actually sort of use it. But I, I, I like the shape of drama and I like the sort of shapes of narrative and the emotional sort of arcs of characters. So when I came to sort of in Italy, you know, I'm, I'm working in Italy, I'm working in German, my German isn't that good, but I enjoy watching my plays where I don't actually have to listen to them. I don't actually understand the words. It makes me sort of appreciate, you know, or see the weaknesses of where the play is uh, emotionally and how the sort of arcs of the characters sometimes and when the audience fall out of it. And I can sense that without any sort of words involved. Um, I'm interested in very sort of physical presentation of, of, of roles. And this is something, you know, I'm, I love American actors, American stage actors. Uh, um, they're, you know, they seem quite sort of fearless and, and really, really, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite similar to Irish actors, I think, in many, many ways, you know, but they really sort of inhabit roles and are quite brave and all that type of thing. I've done work in, in London, and everyone knows it's a, di it's a different thing. It's more of a sort of a technique thing. I don't think my work sort of feels right a lot of the time in, in, their, in their mouths, not just the sound of it, but you know, just the way it's sort of performed and the energy that, the, that it needs to, that it, it demands. You know, I mean, like, there's more sort of similarities than there are sort of differences, you know, like in sort of culturally, I've done a lot of work like all over Europe with different sort of people and seen my work sort of performed, you know, like in various sort of languages. And, uh, and I'd like to think that, the, you know, and I think there is, you know, in terms of sort of theater practitioners, I think there's, it's more or less, you know, it's, it feels quite sort of similar to me. It's the degree of sort of emotion on stage and the degree of risk and the physical sort of risk that, you know, that, that does sort of vary, you know. So the Germans just completely, 
get my work, and, but they think it's quite peculiar that I'm still writing family dramas, effectively. They think it's very, very strange. But they like the, the deconstruction of it and the abstraction of it and all that. Lady Sorry, here? it's such a huge question you asked. There's a lady here and then there's a gentleman there. Yep. That actually sort of leads directly into my uh, question. I saw, the, I saw the show last night and um, was very taken with, oh, I like the way Finton said about the enacting and the evocation, but I found the enacting last night was also pro provocation. I was provoked to think of many, 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 many things. And the thing that struck me most was um, the question that I, that, I, that I bring to you today is how is it that um, you, and you mentioned Conor McPherson earlier, I was thinking of some of his plays versus his Antigone, which opens out. How is this insularity, this familial insularity, how does it at the same time, in some paradoxical manner, open out beyond Ireland? Mm -hmm. I'd, like to, I'd like to hear that, and it's, especially since you just described the new play, mm -hmm. it sounds almost like a feminist, uh, or a, 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 not feminist, sorry, a feminine um, counterpart it is, yeah. to this one. It is, yeah. So, how do you, or do you even think about that? I don't think about it, but I mean, like, I really, I, I don't think about it, but I think what it is, what it is is like, I mean, I, um, I mean, you are having a dialogue with yourself, right? I mean, you're trying to sort of reach into yourself, of course, and, you know, and shake up yourself and ask, you know, like, you know, big questions are sort of like, and, and so the, the work tends to be, tends to be sort of very sort of insular and, and folds in on top of itself and has nowhere to go. A lot of the time, I mean, I'm sort of like, I, I'm aware of the sort of the, the big stuff of actually being a writer and it's all been written before and what the hell am I going to bring to the table? Am I bringing anything at all? So I, I do like to sort of pour a lot sort of like of like of actually anxiety in terms of I'm nothing. I've got nothing to say. I don't exist. I'm not bringing anything to the party here. You know, like and you know, like and in some way that way is it, it, it makes me sort of, you know, um, investigate, I suppose myself a lot. So all the plays are effectively about theatre, about writing, about, you know, what's the point of it, you know, um, uh, that, it, that it just begins to sort of, it eats, eats itself into sort of like into, into, into nothing. And, it, and so a lot of it is about me actually sort of getting through the day and actually, you know, it's my relationship with bloody words that I can't do anything outside of what I can do. And it's sort of, I enjoy it but it really frustrates me that I'm not a bloody plumber where actually I could, I could really actually bring something to the world, you know, like, and, you know, like, you know, like real good stuff, you know, do you know what I mean? You know what I mean? But that is the dialogue, you know, that I feel as if I'm having a lot of the time with it and also wrestling with the sort of medium, you know, that the characters need to proclaim and proclaim and proclaim, but to what? You know, to what? And, and, you know, construct societies and construct sort of rules and, and, you know, like mechanisms within their living room or, you know, like, you know, to what end? Only to try and sort of escape them again, but then probably build more and more sort of routines and, and patterns and all that type of thing. So it's very, very sort of, I know it's very, very universal and biggest influence on my life, you know, of course, you know, would be my, my father. And, you know, like, and, you know, he was a furniture sort of salesman and living in Ireland through, you know, furniture is the first business to go. In, in a recession, and Ireland is just constantly lives in and out of sort of recession. And, you know, and that was my theatre sort of growing up, was seeing this man who was wonderful on the shop floor, could adapt to different sort of situations. But I was aware of this bigger machine and this, this political sort of, you know, the huge thing of just of collapse, of impending sort of collapse at any moment. And I used to have a paper round when I was a kid you know, a very successful paper round around Rohini. And I used to count my money on a Friday. And in the middle of the recession, I used to look at my dad counting his money. And I'd have more money than he bloody had. So I was just like aware as, as a boy of like, of real like, you know, those sort of um, strains upon the sort of the nine to fivers, you know, the people who have to go out there and, you know, and do a living. So all the plays are, you know, effectively sort of about routine, about people caught in patterns and routines and the larger, threats that they feel that they have to either stay in the job, stay in the world, or actually try and break out of that. There's a question here. Can we get a mic down here? There's a question this gentleman has here, and then there's one over here as well. Well, let's take one here first, and then we can get the mic down here. Yes? You were talking about the kind of mechanisms and architectures of a living room space and that kind of insularity. I feel like in the Walworth farce, there's the ghost of Jill Orton and Lou sort of just waiting to from the center of the stage. And so I had one question just about how that's sort of an influence and as you were working on it, 
um, that, that kind of tradition that's outside of an explicitly Irish tradition. Um, and then I have a question about Hunger, um, which is an intensely visual and visceral film. Um, what it was like to collaborate with Steve McQueen, how much you were involved in the visuals, and uh, the really striking 15 minute sequence that's purely dialogue, the only real dialogue driven scene in that whole film between Bobby and the priest. Um, what, uh, whether you, you wrote that entirely or, or what kind of collaboration was really involved um, throughout the film, but particularly in the moments uh, where we get to hear words yeah. spoken. Uh, well, the Joe Wharton thing, of course. I mean, like a you know, would be a fan, but it is like it is. We we don't have a tradition of farce, uh, um, and I didn't really actually read any farce, you know, Molière or anything like that. I mean, when I was when I was a kid, I was interested in Irish theatre. That's about it. So I actually had to sort of pick up books and begin to learn the sort of constructs of that. And uh, so there, you know, but farce is mathematics, you know. So it, it's just it's it's learning it's learning all that, and you know and. Joe Wharton, presumably, you know, like, and Michael Frayn all sort of learned from someone else, you know, like, and uh, uh, I just got in there and learned it. And it's quite, actually, it's quite liberating, you know, writing within a, a mechanism as, as, <laughs> as tight and rigid as that. You know, you really feel, it's, oh, God, you know, it, you, you know, it, it feels, feels quite sort of strong. But, um, uh, but in terms of sort of hunger, yeah, I mean, it's like, well, it was, a very nice experience to work with Stephen Queen, but like it's a uh, yeah the, yeah all the sort of the images. But you see, I deal with images in my work anyway in theatre. You know, it was actually just a matter of all the the the, the dialogue sequence itself was the easiest part to write in the movie. Outside of that, the images all had to be sort of of course constructed and and you know down to you know crumbs on the handkerchief or whatever that was. Everything had to be sort of you know they were the very difficult thing because it's silent. I think the first half an hour is silent. So how do you how do you how do you create some sort of like, you know, narrative sort of strain. So you feel as if the story is actually moving in a forward sort of trajectory, as opposed to sort of just a, a, an artistic sort of insulation, installation piece in a gallery. You know, so we, it's, it, it, it's, it's a very sort of conventional movie actually, but you know, because it does sort of move forward through sort of the, the conventions of, of film, but, uh, um, but he, he pulled it off good on him, so. This gentleman here. Uh, I have to Two quick questions. Well, the first one is, uh, uh, I just want to make a comment that it was a fantastic play, a very emotional reaction out of me, which I've never had ever before watching a play. So I did talk to Michael after the play, uh, regarding, you know, how did you, what did you do? I really hate you right now. Uh, but what were you going through? You said you wrote it in four weeks. What did you go through when you write the play? What was the fundamental motivation of the play? It said it was a relationship with your brothers, and mm -hmm. kind of showcased that. So that's my first question. What is the fundamental motivation which made you write this play? Uh, the second question is a little towards the later half of the play, the introduction of a colored character in mm -hmm. the play and a very uh, deliberate attempt to actually make it white. Mm -hmm. So was that a reflection of London society or was that how is that is race an issue in Ireland, Irish theatre? Has that been tackled or what's your comment on that? Well, on, the, on, the, on that one first, on the sort of on the... Uh, the race thing first. It was. It was to me. It was just that he, that she doesn't. She doesn't fit. She doesn't fit into his narrative. She doesn't fit into his story. Into what he has constructed. But of course, it's sort of you know. It's a. It's a huge moment in the play. It's a hugely sort of strong moment. And I felt as if it was important to have that in there. You know that there was no sort of. There was outside of what he knew. There was. There was nothing. This is his. His prejudices. Is all based upon his creation of farce. His like little country, his little sort of society is is this mechanical thing outside of that that doesn't even he doesn't see her as anything other. You do not fit in this. You do not look like a Maureen, my wife, you know. But it feels from an audience point of view, it's, it feels it's quite a sort of shattering sort of piece to look at. It's quite you know. But it 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 is the sort of the the, the mechanisms and the, the small societies, the small communities that we all sort of create all the time and live with. And as anyone outside of that, we sort of we, we prejudice them in some way. And uh, on the other thing, on, on in, in terms of sort of the motivation, I mean, like it's I, I, I had the I I um, for about two years I, I suffered with sort of a obsessive compulsive disorder. You know, this sort of this recurring sort of thing. Uh, um, I had problems uh, traveling in London. I was living in London at the time. Disco Pigs was on in the West End, and it was at the time of the World Cup, and the play was dying a death. 
no one was going to the play, you know, because they were all like, they were going, but I thought, I thought, oh, I've made it. Is this what theatre is? I don't know what theatre is. And I was, I was partying a lot at the time and, and thinking that I was sort of like, and I, I fell into sort of this, these things where I couldn't actually travel anywhere. I had to sort of have a routine whenever I travelled. Um, I, 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 if I got on the tube, I had to sit in a certain seat. I had a certain, a certain carriage. I had to get up at a certain time and drink a glass of water and put, put a piece of chewing gum in my mouth. You know, and that would work for a while. And then I'd have to bang my leg for a while, eat the chewing gum, drink the water, and then get up at a different thing. So, and this would go over sort of like a month. By the end of it, I looked like some German, you know, folk dancer. I was like this, <laughs> this, 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 you know, like, until, you know. I sort of, I, 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 I was running up the sort of steps of, you know, wherever it was, Green Park, crying my eyes out, going, I'm going insane. Absolutely going insane. But I had to, I used to eat in a particular sort of restaurant every day, but I passed by, I was staying in Shepherd's Bush at the time, I passed by this, this house, and uh, I'd be sort of like, you know, like, you know, walking by and bang, I would see a sort of a window, you know, like, an, uh, so they were doing what they were doing every day, and I was doing what I was doing every day, you know, at exactly the same time. So it was always a man and a woman and her, her son, always seated in the same position in this room. And I would see them all the time, and go, oh my God, it's them again. They were obviously looking at me and going, God, there, there's that guy again, or whatever. But as I sort of walked by, it became this sort of little picture thing. I could see sort of, you know, the Irish sort of, you know, the, the shillelagh, the sort of, you know, JFK picture, the picture of the Pope, all these Irish things. I thought that this is an immigrant sort of people. This is interesting. And, uh, um, and I thought, I'm going to write that play. But it took me 12 years to write it. And, you know, because um, uh, I, didn't have a, I didn't have the chops to do it. You know, so when I say that I, I wrote it in four weeks, I wrote it in 12 years. You know, like, you know, because I wasn't thinking about it. I just knew I wasn't sort of good enough as a writer. I mean, I, I started working on this play about two years ago. I said, oh, I think I'll be ready for this in 15 years' time. But I definitely don't have the intelligence or whatever, the instinct to write, to write the bloody thing now. But it's sort of, so it's based probably on that, and it's based upon my, my, my brothers and myself and my brothers get together like we all do, you know, and we, get, we sit down in my, my man, dad's, my dad's dead, but my ma's, my ma's kitchen, and, uh, you know, come 12 o'clock, you know, telly goes off, and we all start telling the same stories. And, you know, like, and we tell, you know, I tell the story about whatever, and John tells the story, and Dara, and Ulton, and, and then, like, we're all telling exactly the same stories every year because we don't see one another. Tell that story about Dad and how he was in a couch, and the doors of the van door opened in the furniture, and the van door, uh, the van was going up the hill, and Dad was on the uh, couch, and he fell onto the street, and it went down, which is a great story, and true. And, you know, and, and so John would tell that in great detail. So it was all of this sort of, you know, you know, you know, just this is our family history. We must keep it together. We have to keep our sort of, you know, our childhood sort of, you know, alive to us. But we have to keep us together. This is our community. You know, outside of that, you know, bugger them. You know, this is us as four brothers. You know, not even my poor two sisters were involved in it. But, you know, like it was just about us. And, you know, I'm proclaiming these stories again and again and again. I'm just feeling, you know, you would walk away from these sort of nights just feeling like... That's it. That's good enough for a year. Now I don't have to see them for a year. <laughs> I'll tap in a year's time. So there's that. Do we have a question over here? Uh, where am I looking for the mic? Up there. Yes. And uh, uh, thank you so much for coming. I was wondering if you could talk about Irish sense of humor the, yeah, in theater. <laughs> Well, I don't know. Well, I well, I, well, I don't know what it is. Because, but, but I tell you what, I live in London now, and I really, really love going home. I mean, I mean, I forget just how much bloody Irish people talk. I mean, I'm, I've worked with Michael Murphy over there now. He's in the new. Michael's in the new electric ballroom. He's acting in it, and I directed the bloody thing for my sins. But you know, he talks more than me, right? And I, I'm a bit of a yapper when I get going. But I really, really like being around, like you know, people who are just, just, just chatters who talk and annihilate things and you know and just keep on sort of like talking and uh and yeah there's great sort of you know wild sort of levity in there i think irish people like the surreal i'm a big fan of sort of you know flan o'brien and all those sort of, all that type of sort of writing it's very dense work very strange and <laughs> bloody bloody funny but uh um but yeah i think you know my my, my work sometimes in sort of in in, in the UK, people can go, oh, God, it's just sort of, you know, it's the bizarre Irish people fucking yapping to one another and, and telling sort of ja jokes and all that type of thing. But I don't really care. And, you know, and, and, and that's, just, that's, just, that's, just the, that's just the way it is, you know. 
I suppose it was a defining characteristic of Irish humour. It's it's um, it's deadpan. You know, it, it, it's that the gap between the awful and the very funny is really narrow. <laughs> so therefore, you you know, the straight face becomes part of the humour, which is is this funny or is it not funny? Um, I must I, I, I must tell you to appreciate this. There's a, there's a very personal sort of matter, but I don't mind it. You know, I don't I don't I don't, don't mind sort of sharing it with you. When my, when my, da my dad my dad died about sort of like you know nine years ago, and we were all in the room. And as a family, we were we were all in the sort of like, he, he, he died in the hospital, and uh, and um, he was you know he was cancer, so it was like he was he was out for about sort of two days. But as a family, we weren't all together for years, for about sort of like you know seven years, and we sort of like as a whole sort of family. And, uh, and we got together, and we finally got together, and he died. He died, he's <gasps> you know, like, Phew. and he was sort of out, and we were all there, and we are all looking at one another, and of course we were all crying, and, and all this, and losing it, and losing it, and just, uh, and in and, 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 you know, for an hour or so, it was really, really quite upsetting. And then, uh, and then I said, uh, a man walks into a doctor with a strawberry up his arse, and the doctor looks at the strawberry, and goes, you could do with some cream on that. <laughs> and we just fell around the floor, and it was a wonderful, it was a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful moment. I mean, because my dad, my dad would have so sort of appreciate that joke, but it was brilliantly, and then the crying started again. I was like, <laughs> it was, it, but, it, but it was a wonderful, wonderful moment. <laughs> my best moment. <laughs> Perfect definition of Irish humor, I think. <laughs> this gentleman over here. You talked a little bit about And sort of seems to me that theater also does that. It's a, historically getting together and telling stories is the way people identify themselves. But the Walworth farce and also the Brian Friel play sort of work as a repudiation of that. The, the stories aren't to create community, they're, they're to annihilate the truth, um, to, to hide something that people don't want to talk about. And I, I wonder if you'd talk about that a little bit, maybe about how, if, if that, since the Brian Friel play also has it, if that's sort of an ongoing theme in Irish theater. Sounds like a Fintan <laughs> question. <laughs> um, it's a really perceptive point, I think. Um, you, you see, what, what you have to remember, I mean, and, and the reason why there is this very, very fine line between the absolutely appalling and the very funny um, is to do with exactly that. It's to do with the way in which the energy of the storytelling is also an energy of denial. Um, you had Donald Rumsfeld, your great philosopher, you know, who, 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 who uh, you know, famously kind of expostulated about uh, this sort of epistemological questions about known unknowns and unknown unknowns. Um, and in Ireland, I think we've we've had a kind of special variation on that, which he didn't even think of, you know, which is uh, the unknown known. That there's, that it, within, because it's a, it's a very screwed up society in a lot of ways, I mean, you know, which is why it's good at theatre. Um, it, it has incredible capacity to both know and not know things at the same time. Um, so, for example, we've just recently, which we're going through a really interesting period at the moment, where, where it's like all this darkness of the history, you know, is, is sort of washing over us. But, you know, we, we, we ran institutions in the Republic of Ireland for most of the history of the state. Um, where we, we, we enslaved and tortured children, you know, in, in vast numbers. Um, it, I mean, up to, up to the 1990s. Um, the Republic of Ireland incarcerated a larger proportion of its population than any other known society ever. Uh, between prisons, industrial schools where it locked up children, Magdalen homes where, where women who were in moral danger or who had, ba had, had babies outside marriage were locked up, um, and mental hospitals where huge numbers of people who were, who were not mentally ill were, were incarcerated. So the silence uh, is the background against which the manic energy of the language emerges. It, and, and you don't have one without the other. Um, if, if we were a healthy society, the sort of energy of the language, it, it, you, you know, you, you have to think about Beckett. As, you know, it's, the, the Beckett does kind of encapsulate so much of this, which is, you know, if you think of Winnie buried up to her, up to her ditties in the bleeding ground, as somebody says to her, you know, she's buried up to her neck in sand, and the language just coming out. 
that's a bit of what you're getting, you know, is, is, is this sense that there is a buried silence. And you've got the language on top of that, which is, which is sort of coming forth. And there's a comic energy to that, you know, which is there's nothing else we can do except speak or except, you know, use this language and let it come out. And then the language becomes extraordinarily interesting and playful and, um, you know, acquires all this kind of angularity to it. But at the same time, what you're not seeing and not hearing is the repression and the silence underneath it. Um, and that, I think, is where, um, you know, what End is doing or, or what's in Faith Healer, and I, I think you're right, there are really interesting connections between the ways in which language is used in both of those. Is, you know, what makes those plays so powerful, actually, is that sense that, um, that repetition, the repetition of certain stories, becomes a way not of expressing anything, but, but of um, encapsulating the silence. So that, so that the language is really a function of what you're not saying rather than of what you are saying. Um, and that, you know, th there's a real truth in that because often the Irish linguistic gift has been a gift of distraction. You know, it's, it's we're going to talk about this to avoid. And it's like, you know, you, know, you get a kid and you, and you say, you know, did you just break that plate? They'll start saying, you know, I, I, I was at school the other day and there was something really interesting happened and, and, and I saw this guy and it was, it was a great thing and then I was in the playground and this, and this you know, you know, distract, use language to distract. And one of our psychic disturbances is that we, we use language as a form of distraction, mm -hmm. um, as I'm doing now because I can't think of it. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <laughs> we'll take one more question if we have it. Oh, there's a gentleman over here. Can we get a mic up there? Just one more question because we've got to... Uh, Make sure everybody can get to the show. Um, I kind of have a double question. Maybe it's a slight statement. And then, um, is the Irish actor Tom Hickey, is that his name? Yeah. Uh, I met him once a few years ago. He was doing a play by Tom McIntyre at um, the Irish Arts Centre in New York. Mm. And I remember him talking to me about um, the, the role of the playwright, you know, how it's like a special calling, you know, a special thing that you can't be an actor and a playwright because that's just not the way it's done. And there was this real kind of you know, hugely romantic, sort of almost like shamanistic projection of this figure of the playwright, which I feel uh, Ireland has both benefited and suffered from. And um, I'm interested in this younger generation of Irish playwrights who came up in a much more collaborative sort of space, you know. Um, and, but at the same time, I'm wondering, is the way in which they're not writing these kind of grand plays that sort of project a nation, is that related to a kind of a simultaneous uh, reduction in, in a kind of ego or ambition or something. Uh, and my second one, which is the question, is related to, uh, uh, to Beckett and to language and to this idea of language as distraction. And, you know, Beckett famously wrote in French to kind of get away from the, the well, whatever, Kiltartan or, you know, just, just the Irish way of writing. And I'm wondering, um, Enda, if you ever feel like it's, it's just too easy. You know, that you want to like, is it, <laughs> are you cheating, you know? I, like, do, would you ever want to sort of get away from that language and do you ever think you could like, or, or would that interest you as a gesture? Would you, to, which, to, to begin to write in French or German? No, almost like, <laughs> almost like um, just not directly to kind of step outside. I, I mean, this is just, a, a, I'm curious about this, to kind of step outside that identity but of I, but, language. And but I, but, uh, to step outside the, 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 sorry, say that again. Well, maybe time. like, you know, write a play set on Mars or somewhere. Or, yeah. You know, I mean, that's a silly suggestion, but you know. Yeah. Well, my favorite play of mine is called, is called The Small Things, and it's set in Lancashire. Well, it's sort of set in sort of, it's, it uses sort of a Lancashire, a Lancashire I like, of like really all the plays that I've sort of written, I've got no notion about what it is to be those people. And that's why I actually sort of write them. I've got no notion what it is to be sort of a 65 year old woman living in a sort of a rural village in, you know, in somewhere in Ireland, surrounded by fish. But that's a good enough reason for me to actually sort of write it. And you know, like our, our, our you know, a, you know an, an 85 year old Lancashire woman who's the last person to talk in the world because everyone else in the world has lost their tongues. That seems like, you know, so I always feel as if I'm actually sort of, I'm effectively like a middle class sort of boy from Northside Dublin. That's a very dull, that's a very dull person to be. And I would never actually sort of write a play 
about my life, you know, because, you know, it's, 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 it's a very sort of dull thing, you know. So, I mean, I always feel as if I'm actually, I am sort of writing and I am performing. And when I sort of write, I tend to sort of, you know, perform the characters because I want to inhabit sort of different people and different logics and different worlds. You know, of course, you're writing about your whatever tiny soul I might have or heart I might have and my minuscule intellect that I certainly have, you know, but, but you know, but, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I just, I, I always feel as if I'm completely sort of just observing where these characters are going to go or how, you know, what they're going to do or, or, you know, and, and that's, 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 that's a reason enough for me to, to be a playwright, you know, to, to step outside middle class end of world from Northside Dublin, you know, for a while. Well, thank you all very much indeed for coming. I want to thank Enda and Fintan for joining me here this morning. And um, thank you. Well done.